Right. Good morning or good afternoon, good evening uh, to you all. This is Jules Lancé with the Global Network of Healthcare Innovation Centers, the GENIC, in partnership with the Innovation Learning Network. We are excited to share today's Exponential Tech Tuesday, Exponential Patience, The Future Has Arrived. For the past 11 months, we talked about exponential technologies and their application in healthcare, the opportunities, the use cases, emerging technologies. And for our first anniversary edition of this series, uh, let's hear from patients themselves and learn how they are using exponential technologies in their lives. But first, a few housekeeping items. You have been muted upon entry to avoid background noise and disruptions. If you are joining us by phone only and wish to chime in during the Q&A, please press asterisk six to take yourself off mute. Please hold off on Q&A until the end. However, feel free to use the chat box during the presentation for questions and comments, uh, and make sure that you select the option everyone from the drop-down menu. This presentation is a contribution to the uh, GNIC and ILN, which means that you can live tweet throughout, and we will drop the session's social media handles and hashtags in the chat box shortly. Um, so now I'd like to introduce our presenters. We have a two-member exponential patient panel today. Um, first, Maria Filipova. She is a healthcare transformation catalyst, having worked in the industry and in innovation for 15 years as a healthcare executive. And she's here today to share a different view and her personal story. And we have Seth McGuinness, who is a freelance art director and graphic designer recently had the chance to try a 3D printed cast designed by one of our previous speakers, designer Arthur Hasevanikit of uh, Autodesk. And Seth will talk about his experience being a disruptive patient in a traditional healthcare system. We also had Ravi Ramakandran join us, who is the Senior Director of the Digital Health Strategy and Value at Patients Like Me, but unfortunately he had to step out due to a family emergency. So we will invite Ravi to speak at a later date uh, on that platform. Uh, with that, let's turn it over to our panelists and our first speaker, Maria. Uh, the floor is yours, I'm excited. Great, thank you and uh, hello everyone. Um, I'm very happy to be part of the conversation. Um, I wanted to um, share with you my story today um, for two main reasons. One, um, I believe that we are um, better healthcare executives um, and uh, better human beings if we keep in mind the, um, the personal side, the human side of all technology. And um, secondly, I think that there's many patients out there who are going through um, what I describe a very non-traditional uh, situation where they find themselves in a end of one um, type of experience and I think that might be helpful for them. I invite you to join in the conversation. Uh, unfortunately, I'll have to step away um, after I um, give you a little bit of a taste of my ex experience, but um, I invite your comments and questions afterwards over email or uh, Twitter. So, um, in terms of, in, by way of introduction, um, I've been in healthcare for the last 15 years, studying how um, positive outliers come to, to being. Um, anything from um, startups to um, healthcare outcomes that were very low probability of success, but high um, impact once they were uh, realized. And in my 15 years of experience, um, I always asked myself, what, are the, um, what is that first initial impetus that, that pushed the first domino, if you will, that led the rest of the dominoes to fall in place and um, create this cascade of, of miracles that we sometimes need? And why is it that healthcare is such an um, exceptionally difficult case and industry to get this uh, to happen? Um, less than 5% of the uh, unicorns in 2017 were happening in healthcare. And uh, according to Name Your Study, uh, healthcare tends to lag uh, by a decade in adoption of some of the uh, most, what we would describe, well adopted and, and well proven exponential technologies. Um, and so, in those 15 years of studying this as a consultant or as a healthcare executive, I frankly 
um, didn't make as much progress as um, the last 15 months uh, when I experienced healthcare as, as a patient. And that happened in a very um, routine, non, non-expectant non way, right? We are all busy living our lives, going from one meeting to, meeting to another when a routine doctor visit fall ends with, oh, maybe we should get this checked out. Um, and this is what happened to me. I had a meeting with my PCP who uh, did a palpation exam on my abdomen and said, mm, this doesn't feel right. Um, why don't we take another look? And so we did an ultrasound, then we did a CT, then we did a CT, repeat CT with contrast. And then um, what came back to was, was this. Um, the radiology report basically showed that I had a extremely large angiomyelopoma associated with um, my right kidney. And by extremely large, we mean um, they actually meant 36 centimeters uh, by 16 by 15. Um, for those uh, football fans or American football fans in the room, that's pretty much the size of American football or by volume. It's the size of, of the soccer ball that we, we, we use. And so this was extremely rare, um, extremely low probability of event happening for two reasons. One, um, angiomyelipomas are actually very uh, common tumors, kidney tumors. The fact that it was such a large size um, was very abnormal. And the fact that I was um, asymptomatic when we found it was, um, was equally surprising. Um, the other piece that was very unique here was that in addition to that um, angiomyelopoma, I was also diagnosed with a very uh, rare lung condition, um, which pretty much happens one in one million um, childbearing women. And, and that was uh, extremely um, rare again, because the genetic test that is associated or the genetic um, marker that was associated with um, with both the angiomyolipoma and the LAM, the lung condition, was not present in me. So both of these were um, diagnosed as sporadic uh, cases. And because of the size, uh, um, even though I was still uh, asymptomatic, it was very difficult to think about surgery um, because of the risk of bleeding. And it was also extremely difficult to think about um, embolization or going in uh, or stopping the blood flow to the tumor because of the size again. And none of these things were, um, have been done. I have to say that um, back in January 17 uh, last year, when I found about this, find out about this, I was extremely, um, as a patient, um, I was uh, taken aback and um, I was very, um, startled, right? After you go through the whole question of why me and what does this mean? Um, I promised myself two things. One, I promised that this is not going to define me and um, I will continue to, um, uh, to live my life given the fact that I was given a gift that I was still asymptomatic. And the second thing I promised myself was that I would not accept um, uh, the, the assumptions that others had and that I would not accept the uh, there is no, there is, there is no options um, as a status quo, and so I took a couple of, I made a couple of decisions at that at that point, that I think are very um, applicable for uh, many other situations that are described um, or characterized by these very unique situations where you are dealing with unprecedented, low probability of success outcome. Um, my, the outcome that I defined for me was I wanted to remove the tumor um, safely, uh, preserving both, while preserving both my kidneys and not disrupting my life. And to do that, um, I took on a couple of things. First, I, we all um, probably have heard the um, principle, the um, the principle of first first principle thinking, um, which has to do with just deconstructing what we know to the bare uh, truths or to the fundamental truths, um, stripping our knowledge from assumptions or preconceived limitations. And in my case, the assumption was um, that the tumor that I had was 
too big to do anything with. Um, and uh, the, the assumption was in many cases that once you get that diagnosis, it becomes a verdict rather than a diagnosis. And what I started doing after that was I changed my mindset from um, a sick patient or patient to a tumor relationship to a more of a friendly relationship, if you will. What you're seeing on the screen is a 3D um, modeled version of uh, my tumor, the green mass on the screen. Um, the kidney is that brown, smaller mass, um, and the other big brown mass was the, is the liver. And so what you're seeing in this case that the entire right-hand side of my abdomen was basically taken up by the tumor. Um, what I also found out was that, um, again, following the principle of let's really get to the bottom of what we know and what are the facts versus what are the assumptions, the facts are that I've had this tumor for about 10 or more years. The facts are that that tumor um, was uh, comprising mostly of fat, a smooth muscle, and blood vessels, and it has slow growing and mostly it was benign. And with those facts, I actually shifted my thinking from a antagonistic thinking between, you know, a patient who just got a verdict um, to a more friendly uh, type of mindset where I saw the tumor as a friendly teenager who could have done actually much more damage to me and my, my body, uh, while in fact it was um, relatively considerate and gentle, so as far as tumors go. And in that mindset, I... I named my tumor. So uh, what you're seeing here, the friendly green mass is Bertha. Um, no special reason other than the fact that evoked uh, association with bigness. Um, and, and so Bertha uh, and I got to know each other. Um, I uh, sequenced her, uh, did a, a full genomic sequencing done at uh, Health Nucleus. Um, as you see, this is the 3D model. Um, I studied her and um, saw um, all different experts um, on, from urology to kidney to um, oncologists to liver surgeons to geneticists. Um, and I took her traveling with me. With me. So we, um, I continued to do my work, uh, which took me traveling to many different countries. So um, Bertha was... Um, um, an integral part of my life, but as I promised myself, um, the facts were uh, not as frightening. Um, the facts were I had a very unique situation and, um, and I was very determined to keeping my promise, which was uh, continuing my life um, as it was, uh, which led me to the second key decision, uh, which had to do with uh, playing by your own rules when you're in a world of N equals one. In those situations, like in, um, uh, if you're building a new company that has never existed before, or if you're dealing with a, a healthcare situation that no one really has seen before, precedents and white papers and best practices are not always there to support you and give you a crutch. And in that case, you could either despair or think of it as a blank piece of paper or an open field where you could um, make your own rules and and create something truly unique and different. In my case, the fact that um, Bertha didn't not neatly fit in any of the disciplines allowed me to invite into the conversation um, data scientists and programmers and 3D modeling experts and exponential technologists um, and just my friends and support who kept and support network who kept me sane. And in that multidisciplinary um, cross-functional, cross-geographical network, what we quickly started to realize is the fact that birth that was so large could work actually to our advantage because it could be something that some of the medical community perceives as, as a very attractive feature that they could try and do something with. And so very quickly, we were able to find um, an interventional radiologist in Boston who um, saw the size of, of Bertha and um, actually said that based on his research, he thought he can control and embolize um, the tumor. And so what we did was we had a six hour embolization where we were able to take um, off the blood supply 
uh, for about 90%, 98, 95% of the um, blood vessels that were feeding the tumor. It was a very, very successful uh, procedure um, that was, um, again, um, truly um, interesting. And we were able to do it because uh, we were able to say that uh, the fact that it hasn't been done before didn't um, wasn't necessarily a, a limiting factor. Um, after the embolization, um, what was really um, important was to, to think about the new state of um, equilibrium or homeostasis that I needed to find in my, in my body. And um, that's what leads me to my next learning, which has to do with anticipating changes in your own um, homeostasis. So the body finds a way of um, being in homeostasis, whether or not you have a large tumor associated with your kidney. And after we embolized the, the tumor, um, that homeostasis was interrupted. Um, there were a couple of unintended consequences that, that were associated with this. It had to do with um, anything from pericarditis to paralyzed vocal cord. And we still don't know why some of these happened given that we were so careful and um, during the embolization. Um, but for me, the learning here was that irrespective of um, a healthcare tumor or for example, uh, uh, building a new innovation initiative, antibodies are actually going to start um, uh, coming at you when you're trying to do things in a new uh, non-traditional way. And that precious equilibrium, even if it's not the long-term sustainable equilibrium that your body or your organization needs, um, you need to keep it in mind because every time you tinker with it, um, unintended consequences happen. Um, with the next phase of my journey, I got to learn a lot about um, what people might consider the basics or um, the boring baseline. Um, I think uh, some of the most important work that had to get done uh, for my full recovery had to do with um, establishing um, a dynamic baseline that um, in today's world, given all the access to um, IoT devices we have, it's so easy to be able to track all your uh, vitals. I was able to do that. However, just having the data is not enough. Being able to action on it is what's really um, making the difference between um, being a, a, a rapidly recovering patient and um, in effectively coming back with complications. And so in my case, um, our, the data that I was capturing needed to be connected to my baseline of like health, how when I was healthy before the surgery, before any of the embolization. Um, we didn't do that. And because of that, uh, when I was having symptoms associated with um, kidney infection, we didn't catch that early enough on time. And with, with that type of situation, uh, for me, it was incredibly um, insightful to think about that we were able to accomplish something fairly complex, like a six hour embolization on a 36 centimeter uh, tumor, but we couldn't really follow through and connect the dots between what is abnormal heart rate for a patient uh, relative to their baseline, even though it may still be below uh, what literature considers normal. And so for, as, I, as I think about my next steps on the journey, I keep coming back to that dynamic baseline and what the data actually means once we've collected it. Um, you've probably figured out the uh, end of the story. It's a positive story. It's a good outcome. We were able, after, to, after the embolization, we were able to um, remove surgically Bertha um, and the surgery happened uh, just a couple of months ago uh, in March this year. What you're seeing on the left-hand side um, is the full tumor resected from my right kid kidney. I was able, we were able to save both kidneys. Um, I was um, very lucky. Um, I was just, um, I got a, you know, a great experience and a minimal scar out of that um, 15 months. Um, and great experience in terms of learnings. Uh, what Bertha got was a far, fair away, a fair away um, going away party or farewell party um, to commemorate the um, really amazing group of people that helped me get where I was. Um, 
Shauna Butler is with us today, who has been one of the key contributors to my sanity and my um, positive outcome, actually. Um, and we can't understate the, the, the importance of the mindset and the importance of a, an amazing team uh, when we think about um, our personal journeys or professional journeys when it comes to coming up with um, low probability, high, high impact outcomes. Um, so I really invite you to think about um, your next adventure, personally or professionally, in the context of uh, first principle thinking, in the context of creating your own rules, um, establishing a dynamic baseline and minding the equilibrium, the precious equilibrium that you need to uh, constantly revert back to. Um, and with that in mind, I really challenge us all to think about the next outlier or unicorn that we might want to go after and um, share the experience and the learnings of how you how you are able to do that. I'm really thankful for that experience and thankful for all the people who were with me uh, along the lines. And as I said, um, I'm here to continue the conversation on this. Thank you so much, Maria. What an amazing story about you and Bertha. And of course, the journey uh, that you both went through all the way to her farewell party, so to say. Um, yeah. And thanks for the learnings that you share with us. We uh, realize um, that you have to leave us now. Um, but we are happy to connect people with you. Um, after the call, you uh, left your email address and your Twitter handle here. Um, and if anybody have some, has some questions for Maria, uh, please let us know and uh, we'll connect you. Thanks again. Thank and you. So with that, um, I like to hand it over to Seth, our second speaker, on his experience in orthopedics or with 3D printing. Seth, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Jules. That, Marie, that was uh, really uh, inspiring. Thanks for sharing. Uh, here we go. Go, go. A little over a year ago, um, on May 19th, I was hit by a car while riding my bike. Um, I ended up having two scaphoid fractures and one on my elbow, uh, tiny, tiny little breaks and a huge cast. After a few days of uh, living and sleeping in that monster, I uh, Googled 3D printed casts. Um, there were some amazing, there was some amazing stuff out there, uh, including a business in Oakland that would print a cast from your tweets. Uh, <clears throat> we just, went over this, but, and I don't really tweet, but, uh, so I got in touch with Arthur or my friend, Amy, instead, um, Amy, Carl, Amy Carl is a, she had a six month residency at Autodesk and she's done amazing work with 3d printed biomaterial and printing the body systems as fashion. Um, she put me in touch with Arthur Harsu Vanikit and at Autodesk, he was beta testing generative software. Uh, we chatted and he agreed to create a cast for me. Uh, and best of all, it was at no charge. Um, he plugged the coordinates in for a regular cast and then told the software the places that needed immobilization and the places that needed none. Um, he also figured out the best way to make the cast remove with potential, he also pretend, wait, wait, wait. He also figured out the best way to make the cast removable with the potential for being locked by the doctor. We tried Velcro, snap overs, and we settled on pins in overlapping keyholes. Um, you can see the, the pins sticking out at the little places. Um, those aren't always as long. We refined them so that they wouldn't get into my, dig into my flesh. Um, we also worked out the kinks, like the movable parts of my arm, how the movable parts of my arm interacted with the uh, cast. You can kind of see how the 
on the top left how it was uh, kind of squeezing my forearm, and when I twisted my arm, it would it would hurt. Um, so and then and the knuckles were also a little tight at one point. Um, so we kind of did several prototypes, uh, figuring all that out. This whole time, we'd been using my right arm, the castless arm, as a model. Um, this brings up the biggest challenge of the whole process, and that was getting my doctor on board. I showed him the prototype and got the tech nurses excited about what we were creating and asked for his help in making the cast better. He ignored, basically he ignored me and my requests, and um, he wouldn't get involved. I don't know what his reasoning was. I think he was just afraid of being sued or I don't know. But um, I saw the great potential and he was, he just kind of backed off. Um, since he wouldn't go along and I was afraid to ask to have my cast cut off for the initial scan, we used my right arm as the model and created the prototypes from that. Um, at, at one point I decided to be my own health advocate um, through suggestions from friends and colleagues, they're like, just do it. Just ignore your doctor and take, take, take care of it yourself. Um, I had a friend take a Dremel to the cast and she cut it off. Uh, it was a little scary, but we had, we had a metal ruler between the, the, the blade in my arm. So, and I trusted her implicitly. So we, uh, we got it off and we got it. Uh, I got to try on the, the mirrored model onto my left arm. Um, we found out that it wasn't exact. Um, so we adjusted it a couple times and um, we taped it back on my arm and Arthur printed a new one the next day. Um, I was in it. it felt great. Um, walking along the Embarcadero to meet in Gloria, I felt the wind on my skin for the first time in two months, and I felt like my arm was alive again. Um, that night I showered unprotected and washed my uh, right armpit properly um, after two months of doing it with a cast in a plastic bag. Um, the next day I did laps in the pool. The water uh, completely ran over my arm and it felt amazing. I'd only ridden the stationary bike for two months and now I could exercise my entire body. Um, so let's talk about the pros and cons of a traditional cast versus a 3D printed cast. Um, excessive mobilization, it was just, it was completely Every part of my arm was immobilized, even though I only needed to immobilize a couple areas. It was super cumbersome. It was way too thick for what I believed it needed to be. It irritated my skin, um, where the cast hit my elbow, was constantly rubbing. Um, the dead skin, the dead skin cells rotted on my flesh while the cast was holding my arm captive. Um, it was itchy. Um, the doctor told me not to use a um, hanger. So I found a, um, there was no way I couldn't scratch. So I found a, a long um, stick from the kitchen and I was able to relieve some of that itchiness. Um, I was, the, another con was I was in it, unable to wash or exercise properly. Um, I had limited clothing options. I couldn't wear any long sleeve shirts uh, for months. And at San Francisco summer, you know, you need to have a long sleeve shirt. Um, it was just ugly. It got sweaty, it got gross. Um, and that's the inside of the cast for, um, you know, after a couple weeks. And that's the dead skin cells, and that's just disgusting. Um, the pros, my exercise options opened up. My skin was hydrated. Um, it got air. It kept it, nor it kept its normal regenerative process. Um, I could scratch without fear of breaking the skin with a hanger. Um, 
and not just for me, but for other people, it was customizable to each person's requirements. Um, somebody else whose forearm is broken, but not their hand, would immobilize their forearm and less of their hand so they could use their, have complete use of their thumb. Um, somebody who broke their elbow could have a completely different process without having to immobilize their entire arm. And it could, you could extend it to their, to legs and other, other breaks as well. Um, in the days after getting the final cast, um, I refined the, I refined it further. I took off uh, more, I took off unnecessary uh, material. The band across my knuckles was a little tight and it was hurting. So I removed that. Um, and that was a result of it being mummified for two months. Um, it was super sensitive and I couldn't, you know, it couldn't handle any irritation at all. Um, so this is what I started with. That M Munster cast is what they called it. Um, and this is what I ended up. Uh, which one seems cooler? Uh, so that's the story. My big takeaway is if your doctor is afraid and conservative, advocate for your own health. I could have been in the cast much, much sooner if my doctor had been behind the process. Or I could have been in that ugly thing for three months and um, just had to, my recovery process would have been a lot uh, slower. When I first saw when I first saw the physical therapist, she said, "You're kind of further along than you should be, um, or what's typical for your stage." And I said, "Well, I was able to take it off and flex air, flex the flex the 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 break or the my wrist gently and kind of get it back, start the process of getting it back." Um, it was a little scary taking it off, but. I proceeded with extreme caution and I'm like, if you do it too aggressively, you're going to do it again and you're going to have to wear this for a lot longer. So I was fairly conservative and just being able to move my hand gently, I believe um, sped the healing process up. And also I believe that the hydration and the aeration were uh, important aspects of it being a, uh, of healing faster. Um, it was great being part of the design process as another pro, um, and especially with the Autodesk team and Arthur Harsu Venikit. Um, making this cool, funky, otherworldly healing mechanism was a super fun adventure. Um, I look forward to the health and healthcare industry adopting new technologies to allow patients' lives to be impacted as minimally as possible by life's bumps and bruises. Um, and another takeaway is friends were very supportive of this exploration. They were excited to see the, the process and the, the, the progress and the generation. And they were also excited that I was excited. And it was really great to go through that with them. Um, personally, I was really grateful that it was only those bones that were cracked and not my head or my whole life. Um, so that was really, um, the whole, the whole time I was thankful that I was alive. Um, I hope that this process and what I went through will help change some minds within the healthcare industry. Um, so thanks for letting me share my story. And this Thank you, Seth. This is a really cool, I'm just including this because I think it's really cool. And um, it's just a, the, the cast was amazing. And here's some, some links to some other, oh, I was uh, called by the Daily Beast because they had gotten hold of the story and they shared, they wrote a story about my process too. So you might want to check that out. Um, thanks a lot. Cool, thank you, Seth. And uh, what an interesting story. Um, and um, as a compliment to Arthur's story on his design, this uh, bringing this patient perspective, perspective, this must have been very liberating to wear such a 3D printed cast and it looks quite cool too. Um, 
So now we will um, move to the Q&A segment uh, and maybe have some uh, conversation between uh, speakers and audience and audience in between. And I was triggered by something that uh, Jan Ground wrote in the uh, chat box about uh, the, the risks that could have made things worse. Um, of course, you are pioneering using this, uh, these technologies and you, you mentioned the process of getting the old cast off your arm. Was, was this any, any time on your mind, uh, any risks involved or how did you deal with this? The risks of taking it off? Um, well, I, I initially tried to get my doctor to take it off and work with me to put a temporary cast on so I could go to Autodesk, get a scan and come back and get it, get it permit, get it permanently. But he basically just ignored me. Um, and so at one point we were to, I was like, we're going to, we're going to, I'm going to lose my window. I'm going to end up having this on for the whole time. And, um, I needed a scan and the, the right hand didn't mirror the left hand exactly. So I had the cast and I just, I just called my friend Janelle and said, take it off. And I mean, it was, it was a risk and it wasn't tr traditional, but, um, I yeah, well, completely worth it. Yeah. I applaud you for it. Cause the whole journey of course was a risk. I know that uh, Shauna had a, a nurse perspective on this too. <laughs> that she well, so first of all, I applaud you for being uh, advocating for that and ask and asking all these questions and pursuing different pieces. I'm curious on two things. One, um, when your physician, uh, when you brought this to, I'm assuming it's a him because most 97% of orthopedic surgeons are men. Um, what were the concerns? I mean, why did he shut you down on the conversation? Uh, because I can imagine that from the standpoint of keeping you safe, I mean, that it, it's, it's, while it's cumbersome, you know, those bones are really tiny and any type of movement can really get in the way of healing. So there's a lot of reason to make sure that we keep the whole area protected. And it's a really good sign to everybody else. Do not touch me. Um, so there's a lot of safety. And then my, you can answer that. But the other thing I was wondering, did the nurses, as far as scratching yourself, uh, the best tool for that is a knitting needle. And I'm curious if they <laughs> suggested that to you. Because I, when you're saying that with a hanger, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, like infection. No, I, I ended up using a chopstick, which was... That's, that's a good one too. I mean... Um, and it was nicely enameled and smooth on the outside. Good. Yeah. Yeah, the but, hanger you had me worried there. Um, well... The instructions was were basically don't scratch. That's not possible. Which is that's not like possible. saying don't itch. Yeah, don't don't stick anything in your cast to scratch, um, and so and they didn't offer a knitting needle as an option. Um, so yeah, um, yeah, I, I had to I had to make do, and I figured out. What I felt was a safe, safe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the doctor part. At one point, I emailed him and just asked him when I was approaching him with the the potential. He basically misinterpreted. He he. I felt like he misinterpreted my question and said, "I'm glad you're deciding to go with the traditional option," which was completely not my proposal with him. Mm -hmm. um, and at that point, I just ignored him because I felt like I was giving him an opportunity to be on the vanguard and he was totally rejecting it. And also I felt like this is going to, this is going to speed my healing process. This is going to make my healing process more efficient. It's going to, it's going to make it better. Um, and basically I just said, no, it's time for me to take over. And if my doctor isn't gonna help me, then I'm gonna help myself. Um, yeah, so so that, this, that, this is yeah. Dan Crown. Can you, sorry. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Oh. It's Dan. Um, and I gotta tell you, 
This is somewhat life-changing for me. I've been in the healthcare industry since 1979, and I've told people all my life that medicine is an art, not a science. Um, and I'm reading a book right now I just posted in the chat called Complications, A Surgeon's Note on an Imperfect Science. Atul Gawande, who's going to run the Amazon Chase Morgan healthcare company, um, and I'm reading about all, every surgeon makes mistakes, every single one of them, and I'm listening to you guys, you folks who have taken it on yourself, and I'm completely wowed, and I think we all need to do this more. I, I think doctors certainly in general know best. I've worked for them for 40 years, and I think they know best, but if we have doubts, Beth and Maria, I'll be in touch with you. So I just want you to know I'm thinking that. I'm 61 <laughs> years old. I've done nothing outside the healthcare industry. And I agree with what you've done. So standing ovation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. And, and I, what, what really makes me sad is in listening to these conversations that um, there's not a greater receptiveness. And it's, it, it sounds like we just have not had really good communication. And too many times when we have patients, we, we ask or we want patients to be activated and engaged. And the moment they become activated, engaged, we kind of look at this as, oh, man, this is more than I wanted to take on. And we don't really invite those conversations to be more productive. So um, it does. It makes me sad. And it's also really uh, again, a, a, a wake-up call to each of us as professionals when somebody comes in and says, hey, I've got this other way of thinking about it. Um, the best way to respond to that is interesting. Let's let's research this a little bit more as opposed to shutting down the conversation. So um, it does. It makes me sad, and I'm sorry that that was the experience that you had. But so have you ever heard of a, a colleague, a physician colleague who – has listened to a patient's request to do it differently and said, I'll think about it ever? Yes, I have. Um, okay, I, good, I, good. Yeah, you know, I was going to say, my, my experience around that is that a lot, and I'm in a, probably in a very self-selected group that are the experimenters and the people who are comfortable in places where you know, we don't know what all the answers are. And I'm so glad you read Atul's book. And if you haven't read Better and Checklist Manifesto and all those others, they are brilliant. I will. Yeah, I think what he does is, is really helps us to understand um, that so much of this and, and the progress that we've made has been because there's been a willingness to experiment and it's been uh, usually patients who are looking at this and saying, help me. And then you find a team and a, and a set of partners who are, I don't know, but if you're willing to try and to trust, I'm there with you. And oftentimes when those conversations get shut down, what I have seen is that it's a, a certain degree of fear, um, a certain degree of safety concerns that are really hard to explain, and then also some very bad experiences where things have gone really wrong. So, you know, I think, Seth, part of it is you did really well, but there, I can promise you there are a hundred ways where that could have gone wrong. Um, it doesn't always go, it doesn't always go wrong, but that there's a reason why oftentimes these things are, are, um, approached with an enormous amount of reluctance because when you see things go bad, I mean, they go really bad and where you, you've got a known pathway where it's going to progress. That's so much a safer route to go than somebody who loses their entire hand or loses the function of it because we didn't stick to something that we understand better. Yeah. I, I would have loved to have him present the risks and say, well, this is what happens if you do this. This is what happens if you do this. Um, but the conversation didn't. The conversation. Um, and I think that, you know, I, I researched that, that particular break and I talked to people who had that break who didn't treat it properly. And basically one of them can't use his thumb anymore. Um, and I was aware and I think have, having a patient who's not reckless is essential to this process as well. I'm definitely not a reckless person. I'm cautious in my adventure, um, but I think that's kind of necessary. Um, and I would have loved to have a doctor because he, I think he could have Im had important input on this cast and said, well, this is, you could do this better by doing this and this and this where it was basically two designers, one of them a patient, going through this process. Um, mm -hmm. 
And I think his input would have been super instrumental if, if we would have had it. Um, and I understand this is a litigation culture and he was probably very worried about that, but um, I don't know. I just hope for better. Well, and having I these types of conversations uh, lead to that. So I appreciate you sharing the story and, um, and yeah, encouraging yeah. us to be better at our conversations when we invite patients to, to be activated, that uh, we are more receptive to their, their suggestions. Yeah, I, I believe I was the only person in San Francisco with a 3D printed cast while I had it. Um, and I don't think that I was the only person with a broken wrist. <laughs> <laughs> I think there are a lot of broken bones walking around San Francisco and it would have been great to see somebody else in their alien exoskeleton as well. It would, and it would be great to walk down the street and see everybody with a broken bone. With an exactly, alien. especially with this design. And yeah. following, following on that, uh, there, uh, Tim posted a question. How did your post-cast checkup uh, go? Did it all heal properly? And did you get any kudos from any doctors? Um, the physical therapist was super, she's like, why are you healing so fast? <laughs> on the first visit, why, why do you have this mobility? And it's because I was able to remove, I was able to flex gently I was able to take the cast off and, you know, just move it minimally and get it, get it back to where it could move again. And I think, and that was the last two weeks. And I think just that, and also the hydration and the aeration uh, contributed a lot to the healing process and also just uh, swimming. I exercised and I got my heart rate up and um, I was able to, to you know exercise and i think that that was a uh, essential to the healing process and i think that that was great and i've been out of it for a year and i got it off uh, late august or mid august last year and i started seeing a i stopped seeing the physical therapist in december and started with a personal trainer who is aware of the injury. And he's worked with me a lot to build the strength back up. And I'm about 97% right now um, after less than a year. And I guess I could get us uh, another x-ray, but I can, I, I posted a photo of me doing a full wheel, which is a back bend in yoga after about a few months of it being out. Wow. <laughs> and my yoga teacher was super supportive as well. He, he was aware of my injury and he, he told me things to do to not stress it and also build the strength back up. So I think that that was really essential as well. Yeah. Wonderful. So um, I guess this is also an opportunity for a commercial businesses. And uh, Shauna just showed me there's this company cast 21 who is in this area uh, as well. And with that, we are actually at the top of the hour. Um, I would like to thank everyone that joined today's session and in particular, our wonderful speakers that took the time to share their special journeys. Um, and with that, I'd like to hand things over to Cynthia of the ILM.